And she says, I can't do that. And he blew her head off. And she died. Jesus, my God. You've got to remain under the protection and security of the Almighty and walk in the light of his voice. Psalms 91 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Beloved, I want you to notice the number of things that the psalmist attributes to the love, affection, and devotion of the shepherd. And the shepherd is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First of all, he makes him to lie down in green pasture. The shepherd takes him to a place where there is abundance and he will undoubtedly be satisfied. And because of the presence of the shepherd, he can lie down in peace. Amen. Because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, our comforter and helper, we can have the peace of God which passes all understanding. And that will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Because of our obedience to follow him, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. So great that we don't have room enough to contain it. First Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Jesus cares for us. He wants us to be satisfied and completely whole. He wants us to be free of diseases, suffering, and pain. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Isaiah 53 and 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Not we're going to be healed, but we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. My Lord, my Redeemer, my Savior. We're going to give him praise. Yes. You see, God, the shepherd loves his sheep. Yes. And beloved, the shepherd loves you. Amen. The psalmist goes on to say, He leads him besides the still waters. Now, the shepherd never leads the sheep beside fast running water because it would get into the wool. And they would become burdened down and eventually carried away by the current. Yes. But the still waters is like the water Jesus offered us when he said on that last day of that great feast of tabernacles, John 7. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's that water. You see, it's a replica of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. To the Samaritan woman of Jacob's well, he said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who was saying unto thee, Give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. Yes. And we all need to come and drink from that well, which is Christ Jesus. We need to drink and be renewed and be refreshed. He goes on to say that he restored his soul. You see, when he becomes discouraged, the shepherd revives and re-energizes his soul by his power and grace. Jesus Christ, he is grace himself. Yes, sir. He is yeah. power himself. Amen. This is Jesus Christ. And he, the shepherd will revive him. He will re-energize him. It will make him be glad again. He'll show him the joy of his salvation. You see, that wonderful oh, grace, the name of Jesus. which is God, which is Christ, expense. The same grace, my friend, that saved you is the same grace that will sustain you. He goes on to say that he leads him in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. When you are under the protection and guidance of the shepherd, you hear his voice and you obey. We sing the psalm, when he leads me, I will follow. As Christians, we must follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Obedience is better than sacrifice. 
Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Praise God, thank the Lord. Romans 8, 16 says, The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You see? And if we stray, we have a promise. We have a promise in 1 John 1, 9 that says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, that's the promise that we have. And my friend, nothing is going to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Nothing will separate us. Nothing, not even depths, heights, principalities, power. Nothing can separate us because sin has been nailed down to the cross. Jesus paid the price of sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Jesus has paid the price. And all we have to do is trust in Him. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, whosoever, anybody, makes no difference whether you're black, white, brown, or green, Muslim, whoever, whoever will trust in Him, will have eternal life. Because God didn't send His Son to this world to condemn the world, but through Him that the world might be saved. Again, the psalmist goes on to say that he prepares a table before him in the presence of his enemies. You know, though we may live in an ungodly society with Satan constantly on the attack, God will protect and provide for us. Even the good shepherd protects and provides for his sheep. Yes, sir. Psalms 37, 25 says, I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Amen. He goes on to say that he anoints his head with oil. You know, we talked about the fly that lays the eggs in the nostril, and the sheep would bang up his head. You know, when the sheep is in torment and his head is bruised, even busted open, the good shepherd will anoint his head with oil to ease the pain. And bring some comfort to the poor little sheep. You know, and when we are anointed, it refers to God's favor and blessing through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This anointing enables us to do the work that God has assigned for us. Even Jesus was anointed for a special purpose. Acts 10 38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power. And he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. The psalmist goes on to say, he causes his cup to run over. Yes. Now literally that means that his uh, cup is like an abundant drink. The shepherd's cup was a hollowed out stone which could hold maybe 40 or 50 gallons of water. You got the whole flock. And when they come to drink, just imagine you got, you know, maybe 50 at a time coming to drink and they put their head inside there and the water would run over when they dash down in there to drink. And so it is when we come together to praise God, the anointing will come up on us. Remember that the Holy Ghost is in you. And when you pray and praise God, that Holy Ghost stands up. If you remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, stoned to death, his last breath, he looked up. He saw Jesus standing, stood up at the right hand. It's one of the only places where Jesus is standing. He's normally referred to as sinning. But here, when you see one of his servants really enduring to the end, giving his life, not turning back to the world, Jesus had to stand up. That's something we, when we go to the ball game and it's a, the, the ninth inning, the bottom of the ninth and the score, the visitors have four and we have four. It's the bottom of the ninth and we have to bat. Everybody stands up. Two out and the count is two, two balls, two strikes, one more strike, we lose the game. Everybody stands up, and so it was. Jesus was standing up, and he will stand up for any one of you. 
who would put your life out for him. That's what he would do. You see? And that's the anointing that will give us. When we remain in God's word, the anointing will begin to spill over. And that spill over is what will affect people around us. It's better for us to operate from the overflow of the anointing. When we have, when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, that enables us to do God's work. And then that anointing begins to spill over. And that spilling over is what will heal. In the, in the, in the book of Acts, it talks about God performed special miracles at the hands of Peter. Peter was so, he had so much anointing that when he stand up, even if they were to stand in his shadow, people would be healed. Take a cloth with his anointing on it, and they would be healed. That's how powerful this anointing is. And we have the anointing, because the anointing is, it comes with the Holy Ghost. And if we are Christians and we have the Holy Ghost living in us, we have the anointing. But we got to revive it. we got to revive it. In Acts 4, 31, it says, And when they had prayed, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Not for the first time, that's a, that was a refilling of the Holy Ghost. Because they had just come from the upper room. So we pray and we ask God, God, fill me again. I've got something to do. When you wake up in the morning, don't just get up and walk away. You ask God, God, fill me again one more time. Fill me to overflowing. And show me what I must do today. And you operate on the overflow of the anointing. The psalmist says that he enables goodness and mercy to follow him all the days of his life. The sheep doesn't have to worry. They have a good shepherd. One who will lay down his life for the sheep. So I say to you, you need to have mercy to others and God will have mercy. In everything that a man does, God watches. What you sow is what you will reap. You know, forgive and God will forgive you. We've heard so many stories of God's forgiveness. We've learned in Bible study how God is so merciful. Even this morning we talked about God's mercy, His kindness, His love. God is, you know, God just doesn't have love. God is love. The Bible says in John 14, God's a spirit and He is love. You see. So once you serve, you will be forgive and God will forgive you no matter what happens. God has promised to be with you and to work all things out together for good. Sometimes you might be going through some hard, difficult times and you might wonder, where is God? And it's a typical story. Where are you, God? Have you forsaken us? You know, are you going to just let, let me just go down like this? You know, where is the joy and the salvation that I once had? Can you revive me again, O oh Lord? All these are legitimate prayers. Prayers that come from your heart. You ask God for this. You, you are his children. Jesus even said, you know, if, if we who are so wicked, you know, if all children would ask us for bread, would we just give him a stone? You know, if he asks for an egg, you don't give him a, a scorpion or whatever. You know, we, are, we would give our children how much more God who is the personification of, 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 of love and everything that's good. How much more will he not give you the Holy Spirit so that you can walk this life, this Christian walk? God don't expect you to uh, live this Christian life just on your own power. It's impossible for us to do this. We have to do it by the power and the Spirit of God. And we need to ask God all the time, you know, God, fill me up. Fill me up again. Fill me up. And this is the God we serve. He's a God of love. The Bible says in 1 John 4, He that loveth not doesn't know God, for God is love. He's a loving God. My friend, it's, it's easy to give without loving. But it's hard to love without giving. And that's why Jesus gave. The Bible says He gave His only begotten Son. And that's because He loves so much. You know. And this is, this is the message that I wanted to share with you today. How good God is. He's, he's a loving God. You know, he's described as a, as a shepherd. You know, we know that, that the, he talked about the intruder. To just let you know that Jesus is the true shepherd. He's the true shepherd. And he wants to shepherd us. We have an under-shepherd. We have, we have our pastors, an under-shepherd. 
He's not Jesus. But he's, he's walking like Jesus. And he has the responsibility as a shepherd to guide us. So all his mannerism, all his conduct and everything has to be right. Has to be lining up with, with God's uh, traditions. You see, because we got to follow him. And if he's in the wrong direction and we follow him, we all going to stray. You see, and that's why we got we to gotta pray for him also because he's human as well. We need to pray for him that, that he would have the power and the strength to walk and, and do the job that God has ordained him to do. Yes. You see, and we pray for that each and every day. You know, so many of us say that, you know, we're saved, we're born again. Uh, some of us, we say we did come forward and receive, said the prayer. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Many of us have said that. But some of us really haven't been saved, though we said it. You see, because it's not just saying. Salvation comes by the confession. But the righteousness is from inside the heart with the belief. So, all I can say is that, my prayer is that, if you feel that you have strayed away from the Lord, we're going to invite you uh, uh, to come. And the pastor will pray. We'll pray for a revival. If you feel any doubt in your heart that maybe I'm not sure whether I am saved or not, even though I am doing all the things that a Christian would do, but you feel that, you know, I'm not sure, you, you can come forward as well. We're going to pray for you. It's better to be sure that everything is in order than to just feel, well, yeah, I'm, I'm saved. There are people who have been in church for years donkey years and they haven't been saved and yet they were doing all kinds of things I truly believe that as it was in the beginning so shall it be in the end in the beginning the Holy Spirit came upon in the end time here the Holy Spirit abides with you and shall be in you notice the, the tense of the verb shall it's a future thing. It requires you to do something. I believe that many of us would come forward, we hear the word, and we want to believe. So we believe. Then you got to trust. Trusting is like laying out your whole life. When the Bible says in John 1, 12, He that believe on him. Doesn't say believe in him. John used the word on. When you believe on, you've trusted your whole life. That's it. Take it. Like the Philippian jailer, he was about to kill himself. This means that he had totally, he doesn't have life anymore. And he said, what shall I do to be saved? And I said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So he had totally gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ because he had no left. Because he had already slain himself with his mouth and with his actions. But yes, we need to believe on him. Believe on him and the Lord Jesus Christ will come and live in you. God is just, just going to pour His Spirit in everybody just like that. It's a little process. There is a little time process. The Holy Ghost comes. And He brings you. And He leads you. The Bible says that He drew Him. He drew them with His loving kindness. That's how God is drawing us. Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It's a process. And the Holy Ghost... Is talking to everybody and drawing them. And when Jesus sees that yes, this one truly wants to give away that life. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. When Jesus sees that, he says, Spirit, enter in. And this is what we ask you this morning. Pastor, I want to thank you for listening. I hope you heard something that blessed you. I thank you in Jesus' name.